Hey, hey, Jelly Toast here, back with more great Ace Attorney Chronicles. Um, I think now we gotta talk to this guy. I don't think we know who he is. Arm bed. I don't even have any evidence. And let's see. Pop Windbank. Um, proprietor of a pawn brokery on Baker Street that is regularly patronized by Mr. Sholmes. He has a very great sense of responsibility to his clients. Gina Lestrade, young pickpocket, blah, blah, blah. She and Iris have become firm friends since. Okay. Iris is 10. Okay, seven year difference. Not that bad. I'm here. Hey, Miko, how you doing? Thanks for joining. Happy Tuesday. Um, so we have no idea who this guy is right now. So let's talk to him. Picture postcard gentleman. Excuse me, but oops, I forgot I'm talking to this game. Excuse me, but who are you? I don't remember the wor a voice I gave him, so... One would expect the Inquirer to introduce himself first. Though clearly you're not British, so perhaps our ways are foreign to you. Did you do the 14 events? Uh, yes, I did. I checked my MGP. I only have like 230,000, so I'm not gonna get the car. <laughs> Maybe next year. Oh, sorry. Yes, we're from the Empire of Japan. We're studying here. Oh yes, Japan. I've heard talk of the place. Its inhabitants live on some fiery brown-colored soup, dressed up with exotic spices. Oh, miso soup. You might be thinking of somewhere else. And what was that theatrical gesticulation about? Or is he talking about curry? The car cost 200,000 K? Wait, what? It wasn't 2 million? Wait, 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 wait. FF14, um... What's the car? Does it end to... What? No? Do I have 230,000 MGP? I don't remember how much MGP I have. Um, FF15 car. Events. The Sabo Tender... So the regalia car. Uh wait, I have to do an event. Oh! I didn't do the events. I didn't do the 15 events. Uh when does it does it end today? Uh, oh! Wait, that's the hairstyle. 20,000 MGP. Oh, uh, the 15 uh, crossover event 2021. I need to see when it ends. <laughs> uh, do, do, do. Come on, loads don't load. It just started yesterday. It goes for a month. Oh, okay, so I have enough time. Okay, so um, I'll maybe jump on that like tomorrow or something. Or yeah, because I think I might want to stream it, especially if I do manage to get the car. Yeah. Do I have 230,000? Or do I only have 23,000? It would be silly if I only had 23,000. Should have jumped in yesterday for fashion. I did the fashion report for this week. The olive green shirt and the olive green pants and the sunstone bracelet. I did that. Perhaps. Anyway, if you are a gentleman, sir, you offer your own name first before inquiring after the name of a modeler. Of course, yes. I am Nido Skenaruhoro. I'm a lawyer. Well, a student of law, really. My name is Susoto Mikatoba. I'm Mr. Naruhoro's assistant. I see. My name is Benedict. Yes, Eggert. <laughs> Benedict. His name is Eggert. <laughs> what kind of a name is Eggert? Unless you bought something since last time, you should have like 140k-ish. I didn't buy anything. Yeah. Oh no, I bought lotto tickets. So I spent like, like 500 MGP. Cause I bought three. Enchanté. Oh, is he French or is he British? He's so refined in how he holds himself and how he speaks, but that name is suspicious. No, to the mother's hands. My overcoat, return it at once to someone with the style to carry it off. Uh, every move makes, every breath he takes. I 
can't stand watching them. <laughs> Every step you take. Is that it? Do I talk to you? No. Then do I talk to Gina? The gentleman's accusation. Miss Lestrade, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a titty pop? What is what the gentleman's saying? What do you think? It's all lies, ain't it? Obviously. I swear to my life, I ain't never ate laid eyes on that dandy before. Let's hear it now, you little ragamuffin. You stole it, didn't you? That ticket you brought in here just now. I really don't remember the voices I gave Hey, Smith, how are you doing? Thanks for joining. Happy Tuesday. No, I swear it. I swear to God. It was barely an hour ago. I was walking along the street, minding my own business. When this little gutterling ran into me, I knew at once what had happened. I've been robbed yet again, I thought to myself. Those wretched pickpockets. Yet again? Oh yes, as you can see, I'm a man of impeccable style. This isn't the first time that I've been targeted by these backslum scoundrels. Now then, relinquish my overcoat. I don't know if I like this guy because he's very funny with his motions or if I should be like suspicious of him. Also, there were two dudes that appeared at the end of case four, like towards the middle of case four investigations. It's like, who the hell are those guys? <sighs> Come along now, Mr. Strahd. Give the good gentleman his coat back. If you're going to cause trouble, I shall have no choice but to call the police. Hold on, why does everyone think it's me? Just look at this dandy cove. You think I'm the dodgy one? I'm sorry, but no one's going to believe you. Well, what about evidence? Yeah! Where's your evidence that I've stolen something, eh? Come on, let's see it! Oh, I have evidence, naturally. What?! Evidence! Evidence that the article Miss Lestrade redeemed actually belongs to this gentleman. Of course, we need only consult Mr. Windbank's ledger to know the truth. We'll be able to look up the name of the person who deposited the article in the first place. Yes, brilliant. Very sorry, but I'm afraid that won't be possible. Oh? I never ask customers' names. That's a strict policy of mine. But why not? Well, now, as you can imagine, some of my customers have circumstances to consider. A great many of them prefer to maintain their anonymity. Yes, I see. But then how can you know if an article belongs to the person asking to redeem it? Oh, it's quite simple. Good sir. Might I trouble you for the watchword associated with the article in question? Of course, it's... Professor. Yes, that's right. And all the evidence we need. This gentleman is the rightful owner of the article, without doubt. A watchword? Interesting. Watchwords. So, about these watchwords, Mr. Windbank. As I just explained, I never ask customers' names when they deposit items with me. Pretty toes, haha. <laughs> hey Kirby, how you doing? Thanks for joining. Happy Tuesday! I didn't do Ring Fit today because I didn't have time because work was actually kind of busy today. But I did go for a walk at least, so I got some exercise. I hope everyone's healthy. I didn't play for a week, oops. It's okay. If you're feeling tired or if you're busy, then that's fine. Oh, you got to your parents. That's totally fine then. Yeah, if you're visiting family or if you're traveling, then just say goodbye to exercise. It's not happening. But yay, that's fun. Going to stay with family. That's nice. There are many reasons why certain customers would like to keep their activities secret. 
That wasn't exactly a subtle glance at Mr. Sholmes now, was it? <laughs> Great detectives have no dark secrets, none at all! Yes, well, anyway, that's why I always ask for a watchword whenever I accept a new article. In many ways, it's like the secret combination of numbers used to unlock a vault. The date of deposit, a description, and a watchword uniquely identify each item. And, of course, then I give the storage ticket to the customer. When someone comes to redeem something, I ask for the ticket and a watchword. And if that someone tells you the correct watchword, you return the article? That's right, sir. Yes. Just as soon as the requisite fee is paid. And I have supplied you with the information you require already, but for the avoidance of doubt... The article in question is an overcoat, deposited two months ago on 15th February. Oh, after Valentine's Day. With the watchword of Professor. Stupid Papa. What? What Papa? Is, are there ads running? No. All perfectly correct information, sir. But, but, ow! Really, this is beyond a joke now. There's no further room for doubt. It fits in perfectly. So, let that be an end to the matter. And thank you for your custom, Mr. Eggert Benedict, sir. With such reasonable rates of interest, I may even decide to come back. This is why I hate grown-ups. Just because I'm a diver, everyone thinks that makes me a liar. I mean, it doesn't really help your cause, Gina, I'm sorry. Oh. Shit, <laughs> not an ad switch telling you something, I don't know. <laughs> Ooh, you're haunted. And the contents of the coat pockets, if you please, broker. But of course, sir, here's the disc for you. Spooky toast. Oh yeah, I can't do um a spooky, spooky Halloween game this year. Reason being, since I moved apartment buildings, um, I used to live on the first floor with a lot of carpet and like loud street noises. So if I yelled, no one really cared. But now that I moved to a quieter neighborhood and I live in the middle floor, then my upstairs neighbors and downstairs neighbors uh, hear me if I'm too loud. And if I scream too late at night, they will be mad at me. So unfortunately, no more uh, Fatal Frame. No Fatal Frame this year. Sadly. Unless I decide to play during the daytime, but yeah. Your parents live in apartment too? Mm hmm. So no Half Life. Oh no, Half Life. Daytime Fatal Frame, do it. Um, daytime Fatal Frame might be nice. I'll see if I could uh, do it. See if I could have some time free to do it. But definitely not nighttime sadness. Just this one. Pardon, sir. I was expecting another. Uh, that is, I deposited another. Another disc? Oh, um, oh dear. I regret to inform you, sir, that what was deposited with me was merely the overcoat. The disc happened to be in one of the pockets, but I was completely unaware of it until now. So, Gutterly, you're hiding more of what's rightfully mine, are you? Says you, eh? It. Very well. Then I shall bid you farewell. Say goodbye to style. <laughs> what style? Wait a minute, that disc is mine. Oh, what, what do you think you're doing, you little tramp? You've you've drawn blood, you filthy animal. Where? Oh my! Yes! There's blood on the disc! Uh oh. It's because of all those sharp little bumps. That's what she said. That man must have scratched his finger on them. But he's wearing gloves! I found it first, alright? I mean, it belonged to me, old man! Uh oh. Gina, what are you hiding? 
So you're not having it. Oi, you. You take it. Me? If I add on to it, they'll have it off me again. So you keep hold of it. What's... What makes you think they're not going to take it off of me? Miss Lestrade, I... Why is this disc so important to her? Metal disc used to play music in a mechanical music box. The piece of music which remains to be unidentified is stored on the disc by means of small protrusions. You there, in the block livery. Excuse me, I'm not in the livery. I am not a footman. Hand that disc to me at once, please. No, don't! He's lying! Grown-ups are all liars! You're 17, you're practically a grown-up. Calm down, girl. Ugh, what do I do now? How am I going to resolve this? Uh, can I get out of here? <laughs> if I get out of here, will that work? Um, let me see if I could examine them first. Oops. Uh, I'll try talking to Gina first. Wow, Miss Lestrade is really looking daggers at that mysterious gentleman. We need to do something to calm things down before she loses control and attacks him again. What would that be? Do I? What about you, Mr. Windbank? What do you say? Look at Mr. Windbank watching diligently over his shop. There are still so many things I'm curious about. But somehow I don't really feel like this is the right time to be browsing. Uh, it's easy just make a fort of cushion. It should absorb the sound. <laughs> In my entire room, that's crazy. Calming this fraud situation must be our first priority. And I'm fairly certain that we can find just the great thing we need among the articles here in the shop. Oh, the the music box. No? Look at Mr. Windbank watching. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, what, do I talk to Benedict? Look at those piercing eyes. He's clearly in no mood to talk. We have to do something quickly before this mysterious gentleman leaves to fetch the police or something. What am I doing? I can't examine the music box. Do I talk to Sholmes? Um, Mr. Sholmes? What are you examining with such keen interest there? As you enjoy a bar of caramel, I see. You know, like when you're a kid, just don't pass out. What? <laughs> So, you found me at last, Mr. Nabuhodo. Sorry? After that young pickpocket set me on my way, I was forced to lurk in the shadows. Cruelly ostracized as the rest of you partook in the jovial atmosphere of fellowship. It wasn't very jovial. I had nothing to occupy my mind, but was too ashamed to let society see my downfall, what my downfall had done to me. So, feeling more interest, I pretended to examine the tedious trinkets in this desolate place. Whilst, as you surely observed, gnawing on the only friend I have left, this 7% solution of caramel. Pray, do you claim to understand the depths of my despair, Mr. Nadahuru? But how could you? I was so lonely, so desperately lonely. Then why on earth didn't you rejoin the conversation? Things have gone from bad to worse here, you know. Yes, I haven't heard much of your conversation. Or rather, in my craving for human contact, my ears devoured every word that was uttered. <laughs> you really were sad, weren't you? Poor Mr. Sholmes, I feel simply awful for you. It would seem that my inferences are correct. Oh? Surely you're not about to tell us that you've solved the entire case once again. She has some rose-colored lenses on for this guy. It's like, ugh. <laughs> He can do no wrong. My dear madam, sometimes I wonder. Were my genius for deduction to be co commoditized? How much could I pawn it for? It seems Mr. Sholmes has had another of his flashes of inspiration. Oh, is it gonna be another deducing? I hope so. Deducing is fun. But who knows if it will help resolve the situation between Miss Lestrade and the mysterious gentleman. What's the right thing to do here? Listen to the deduction! It's time to deduce! Well, Miss Lestrade, it would appear you find yourself in something of a predicament. What 
the blue blazes have you been, eh? Pardon? When the lady's in trouble, a true gent's supposed to be there to help. Straight away, not an hour late. I don't like Gina. She's annoying. She's a brat. How much is Jelly worth? Five million dollars. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Harsh. And who, Preto, are you? Mr. Eggert Benedict. You have, in my eyes, a veritably encyclopedic array of curiosities about your person. Kirby, oh my gosh, thank you so much for the five bits. <laughs> five million. Thank you so much, dude. Nevertheless, there are two immovable conclusions I've, draw I've drawn. I beg your pardon. The first is this. The true reason for your visit to this pawnbrokery today is something you have not yet revealed. <laughs> and the second is this. A considerable crime is in contemplation, one you will orchestrate with the intent to steal a vast sum of money. Well, Mr. Benedict, what say you to my deductions? How? He's turned as white as a hard-boiled egg. <laughs> It would seem that once again, Mr. Scholes has made a flawless deduction. Just who do you think you are, sir? Ah, uh, yes, as I hoped. That is precisely the pained expression I was looking for. I want to know how old Egbert is. I wonder if he's in my court record now. So, shall we begin? Not before I look at the court record. Uh, can I examine this in detail? Look at all the little bumps on the disc. They're so tiny. Yes, the protrusions are called pins, and they pluck the teeth of the comb to make notes. And just on the edge, there's a small amount of blood. Yes, the blood of the mysterious Mr. Eggert Benedict. When Miss Lestrade tried to grab the disc from him, the pin scratched his fingers, it seems. Like when you're grating some daikon radish and accidentally catch your finger. He was wearing gloves! How does he get- oh, whatever. Ouch, just thinking about it hurts. and puts me off eating radish. <gasps> Whoa! Mr. McGilded! Oh, there's a little scrap of paper stuck on the reverse side of the disc. Look! And a scribbled word or two. It looks like somebody's name. From McGilded? McGilded? It couldn't be. But it is, Mr. Naruhodo. A name I shall never forget for as long as I live. But why? Why is his name on this? Doo -doo -doo. On the reverse side is a note that reads for McGilded. Bum, bum, bah! There he is. Edgar Bennett. We don't know how old he is. Young English gentleman with an aloof and high handed manner, he appeared at Winnebeg's pawnbrokery, accusing Gina of stealing his redemption ticket. Anyway, let's begin deducing. The time has come for yet another Herlock Sholmes logic and reasoning spectacular. Great deduction, the game is afoot. Topic one, mystery man's aim. First of all, we must ask ourselves on what business you ventured into this pawn brokery today. Pawn brokery today. You claim to have followed this pickpocketeer, having had the redemption ticket stolen from you on the street. But that is most certainly a lie. The real truth is something quite different. As revealed by that which you hold in your hands. Yes, what brought you to this little shop in the first place is the staff recruitment flyer. The piece of paper in your hand is a staff wanted an advertisement from this very shop. Yet even the most unobservant would soon realize that a man of your appearance has no need of such employ. In other words, there is some ulterior motive for your actions. I did most of what I want to do in 14, minus some savage duties and endgame crafting. I already have all my- <gasps> You have all your crafters at 80? My highest, um, not crafter, but highest disciple of, um, hand is minor at like 42? Oh my gosh. I'm thinking I want to boost up crafting before I start leveling like other um, 
main job classes so that I can earn money. <laughs> uh. The cane, which you unwittingly touch to your person, exhibits an incontrovertible contradiction. Mine is a disciple of land. Oops! Yeah, disciple of land. My highest disciple of hand is probably goldsmith at 32 or 35 or something. Yeah. What's utter rot? I've, I've had this cape for years. The contradiction of which I speak is, of course. Missing ferrule. The end of any walking cape would be terminated with a metal ferrule to protect the wooden tip. And yet, detailed analysis shows the wooden tip of the stick to be utterly bare. Or it could be the wrong initials on that staff. It's AG. Who's AG? He's EB. Therefore, there's only one conclusion. If you want help, I can help you level up to 80. Um, help me level up to um, Gunbreaker up to 80. I really want to do a tank class. The rod that which you hold in your hands, which appears to be a walking cane, is in fact no cane at all. Uh oh, there's a rip! In his shoulder, the coat doesn't fit him. You recall, sir, is something wrong? I will, I. And in your recoil, you would inadvertently facilitate the answer of the next conundrum to present itself. Namely, what is the truth behind this Roger Bear? I hate playing tanks, they are literally in charge. I just want to level up Gunbreaker because I think Gunbreakers are cool. Otherwise, I don't like playing tank because it's too scary. Like, all of the respons- most of the responsibility rests on you to, like, soak up all the damage, stay alive. It's just, ugh, stressful. Yes, your reaction betrays the truth. The handle, which you evidently would like to conceal, is the key to understanding this riddle, you see. From the moment I saw it, my suspicions were aroused. Ooh, aroused. What walking cane demands such a short handle, mused I. But of course, as I said, this is no walking cane. No, that rod. It's the broken handle of a shovel. What? Are you insane? And now, having determined this undeniable truth, the conclusion is clear. Your true motive for coming here. What's take employment at his establishment in order to excavate the grounds beneath the premises? What's a calculated crime? You have conceived, sir. A wickedly calculated crime. No, controls. No. <laughs> To tunnel underneath the pawn brokery. Oh my gosh. Lusty toast. Ooh. <laughs> the great crime. Now, Mr. Benedict, let us continue. For we must expose the details of this elaborate crime you have been planning. This is utterly absurd. You suggest that I, a gentleman, intend to excavate the grounds beneath this pawn brokery with a broken shovel. What on earth do you propose I expect to find there? <laughs> Some long forgotten treasure, I suppose. <laughs> Safe for such a fanciful theory, what possible reason could I have to do as you say? Oh, but there is ample reason. As you are only too well aware, Mr. Benedict. Ah, and your furtive glance is more telling than I could have hoped. What? Let us consider what would motivate a man to infiltrate a shop such as, such as this and covertly dig beneath its floor. No, that makes sense. I think he's right this time. <laughs> How is he going to dig a hole right in the middle of a shop? Like, it's so silly. The answer is revealed by the council notice on the counter which your eyes were inadvertently drawn. Or the gun. This letter gives notice of public works to be carried out in the local area. And according to the enclosed plan of the upcoming sewerage works, beneath the shop runs a sewer that adjoins another, one that runs under the bank on the opposite side of the road. This madness has entered the sewers now, has it? By excavating the ground beneath our feet, you would gain access to the waterway that flows into that flows in very close proximity to the great vaults of the financial institution opposite. What are you? 
In summary, sir. We devised a master plan to pull off an elaborate bank robbery by dint of the underground tunnels. M master plan? Which brings us at last to the final chapter of this lurid scheme. With what plunder did the thief hope to make off from the underground vault of the bank? Are you quite serious? Having co consulted with Scotland Yard some days ago, I happen to know the answer. But naturally, the answer is no secret to you, is it, Mr. Benedict? I have no idea what you're talking about. Allow me to present a rather interesting piece of evidence. You see, this picture postcard tells us all we need to know. Huh? The London Circus? Postcard of the Great Exhibition? I'm afraid you've quite lost me. Currently in the final stages of preparation, the Great Exhibition will soon be underway. And the government has provided extra funds to complete its centerpiece, the Crystal Tower. Funds that currently sit in the vault of the bank. On the other side of this road. He's amazing. He's... he's crazy. Pardon? Yes, the considerable crime you have been contemplating. Is the theft of that which sits in the vault of the bank. The special reserve funds for the Great Exhibition. Of course, that is top secret police information, so keep it under your hat, please. You just blurted it, blurted it out to a whole room full of people. Steal the Great Exhibition's reserve funds. If you go as tank, I go as healer, we will is the queue. Heck yes, we will! Thus concludes Herlock Shobe's great deduction of this pawnbroking puzzle. I'm only like level 62 gunbreaker though. So anytime I do the duty roulette, I go to the um, the dragon tower from Heaven's Ward with the ice dragon. It's not bad, I'm used to that dungeon now. Um, Mr. Sholmes? Well, Mr. Madohudo, an impressively upbeat deduction for a de detective wracked with loneliness, would you not agree? Was it true what you said about the bank over the road and what it has in its vaults? Indeed, though few know of its existence, it is one of the government's most closely guarded secrets. Gregson told me in the strictest confidence. But you just announced it to everyone here, rather loudly in fact. Ah, <laughs> and if it's such a big secret, how would Mr. Benedict have come to find out about it? There can be one explanation for that. Clearly it is because the man is a criminal. <laughs> but what if he didn't know anything about the money in the vault? If he is a criminal, as you said, then buying a brand new shovel is sure to be the first thing he does now that you reveal the secret. Oh. Or if he doesn't, Maybe Mr. Windebank will. He already has plenty of shovels here, after all. Oh my life. I assure you, I'm not so unscrupulous. Hmm, well, hopefully this has taught you a valuable lesson. Sensitive information must be handled with the utmost of care. I knew that already, Herlock. One can never be sure that someone privy to secrets won't disclose them. And once the word is out, it's out. <laughs> Perhaps I'll think twice before confiding in you next time, Mr. Scholes. An excellent idea, Mr. Nadhuro. An excellent idea. <laughs> I can help you do Eureka too. Don't I have to like get started with Eureka though? I don't think I like did the prerequisite quests. Well then, Mr. Nadhuro, you know what to do, I'm sure. Yes, let's listen to that great deduction again and see if we can massage it into shape. Ooh, massage it. All in good time. Very well then, let us start once more from the beginning. Of Herlock Sholmes' magnificent logic and reasoning spectacular. Do, 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 do. Course correction, hold it, Mr. Sholmes. First of all, we're going to solve what busy pawn brokery today. Claim to have followed this park right here, but that is most certainly alive. Something is quite different. As revealed by wishing you're holding your hand. Yes, what brought you to the shop in the first place? Staff recruitment flyer. 
So, by Mr. Shulman's reasoning, Mr. Benedict came here in order to apply for a job so he could dig down through the floor. Yes, and then attempt to tunnel into the sewers to gain access to the money in the vault for the bank across the road. But he wouldn't get very far with a broken shovel, would he? No, I think it's fair to say his motives lie elsewhere. The question is, where? What did bring Mr. Benedict here at this particular point in time? Um... Aha! Aha! Ah, look at this! It's a picture of Gina! Oh! Look at all the scribbled notes on the back of the flyer here. I don't believe it. What is it? Listen to what it says. Name, Gina Lestrade. Height, 5 foot 2. Green cap, scruffy waistcoat, grubby white shirt, blue satchel, ragged. It's a detailed description of Miss Lestrade. Goodness! There's even a sketch of her, hat and all. Although if he showed it to her, she'd fire that smoke grenade launcher in his face for sure. And look, the details of the shop have been written down here too. Windebacks Park Burgery, Baker Street, Redemption Deadline, 15th April. Which is today's date. Why would Mr. Benedict have all that information scrawled on the back of that piece of paper? Maybe he was in cahoots with the Gilded? That's not stalkery at all, for real. Yes, what you brought, uh, what brought you to the shop in the first place is the info about Miss Lestrade. Quite so, my dear fellow. It would appear that the writing and sketch on the reverse of the flyer. Pertain to the pickpocket, Miss Lestrade, and to Mr. Woodenback's palm brewery here. Ah. Oh. You originally told us. That you had merely given chase after Miss Lestrade stole the redemption ticket from you. But that, sir, is a thinly veiled lie. It is the information on the back of the flyer that led you here today, by which I mean. Here to win the bank's pawnbrokery, and today, the redemption deadline of that overcoats. So you waited outside for the young girl matching the description you have written down to arrive. Hmph. <laughs> And you have gone to some lengths to hide the reason for your pursuit of Mrs. Strahd. In other words, there is some ulterior motive for your actions. Boom. The cane which you unwittingly clutch your person exhibits an incontrovertible contradiction. Without a rod, I have had this for years. The contradiction of which I speak is, of course, missing feral. Um, what's a feral? It's the metal cap commonly found on the end of a cane, Mr. Nanohodo. Ah, the bit that makes the nice clacking sound on the pavement. Yes, exactly. And Mr. Sholmes is right. It appears to be missing on his cane. I've never been a massage type person, never felt comfortable with someone rubbing my shoulder. Okay, here's the thing. I don't feel comfortable with other people touching me too, unless it's like really close friends or family. But if you go do a good massage place, so good. It will really help with like all the knots you have in your back. Like things you never realized that were like tight or uncomfortable in your body. Like they'll just release it all and it feels really good. Yeah, I don't, like I said, I don't like people touching me either, but <sighs> massage, it's worth it. Like I couldn't move, like turn my neck to the left for like two months or something. But after I got a massage, like I could move my head around again. Is that amazing? Virtual hug, thank you! <laughs> Virtual hugs again, thank you! But it doesn't actually look broken, does it? Oh my gosh, Kirby, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the hugs. No, it doesn't. But the gentleman certainly did recoil when Mr. Scholes identified the cane as suspicious. <laughs> More hugs, thanks, Kirby! In other words, I like that because you said you don't like being touched. Oh my goodness. But virtual hugs is fine because no one's really touching me. <laughs> There's some secret about the cane that Mr. Benedict would rather we don't know. I usually use hot water from shower head on pulse. Man, I've never had a fancy shower head, so I don't know how it feels, but I heard it's amazing. When I move into like a permanent place, I would like to get a pulsing shower head. I bet it feels nice. <gasps> oh, okay, I examined it, I didn't present it. Oof. Look here, Mr. Sato. There's some letters on the handle. 
Ah, yes. Those must be initials, I think. In the West, it's customary for people to engrave their belongings with the first letters of their names. So, Herlock Sholmes would be HS, you mean? Showery toast, sorry toast, touchy toast. Uh, I don't really like touching other people too, unless I'm like super comfortable and close to them. That's right. And the initials on this cane, obviously. Oh. A-G? Why does it feel as though that's not quite right? Then we present this! The contradiction of which I speak is, of course, the initialing. Yo, I want some chocolate milk right now. Oh my gosh, I just got a craving for chocolate milk. Holy crap. A most astute observation, wouldn't you say, Mr. Eggert Benedict? <laughs> P.S. I modified it to get more pressure. Oh, that sounds so nice, smooth. We're led to believe, sir, that your initials are E.B. Yet in a most possessive manner, you have in your grasp a cane bearing the initials A.G. An incontrovertible contradiction indeed. Would you not agree? No, you're, you're wrong. This cane isn't. You said before that you'd had that cane for years. Ugh. So don't try to tell us that you just borrowed it from a friend or found it in the park. In short, Though you hold yourself to be a gentleman, you have withheld your true name. Ah, the ripping a sound again. You be closer. Is something wrong? I will die. And then you recall that you had a kind of presence of. Namely, what is the truth behind the rock bear? Yes, your action betrays the truth. The handle which you are evidently likely to conceal. So, I see. Let's consider the bare bones of what happened here. Miss Lestrade redeemed that fine looking overcoat. And now a mysterious man has appeared, introducing himself with a fake name. And claiming that the overcoat belongs to him. But we know that he actually identified Miss Lestrade from a written description. Which suggests that everything he's told us is untrue. So what we need to do here is somehow prove that the overcoat cannot possibly belong to him. Uh, Ripperoni! The split seam. The split seam, which you evidently would like to conceal, is the key to understanding this riddle, you see. Ah. Yes, because the overcoat is rather obviously a poor fit. Having forced it over oh, uh, this is Junosuke. Having forced it over your broad shoulders, the seam is already breaking apart. My suspicions were aroused from the outset. When you so badly lied about your name and so boldly waylaid this pickpocket. Ugh. This catalogue of untruths has been for one very specific purpose. To steal the article that the young girl redeemed from Mr. Windebank. But what really irks me is this. The considerable crime I initially imagined has been considerably curtailed. To abscond with a redeemed item. Solved. So what secrets does a disc hold? Now, Mr. Benedict, let us continue, for we must expose the details of this elaborate crime you have in the planet. This is utterly absurd. You suggested all your gentlemen to do... Oh wait! Oh, well, oh no, that was a new line of dialogue. Whoops! You suggested I, a gentleman, designed a wee to fill some tawdry article of pawnage. Have you forgotten that I redeemed the article in the proper manner using the watchword? Oh, excuse me. Had I not been the one to deposit it in the first place? How could I possibly have known the relevant details, n'est-ce pas? Wow, French I could actually read! Oh, but the watchword can be discovered. As you are only too well aware, Mr. Benedict. Ah, and your furtive glance is more telling than I could have hoped. 
What? Let us consider how one might come to learn a secret watchword relating to the pond's property of another. The method is revealed by the council notice on the council with your note. <laughs> The direction of the deduction must change rather dramatically now, I think. Yes, no more talk of tunneling into the sewers. Which is a pity, because it all sounded rather exciting. No, that sounds gross. It's like Shawshank Redemption, but grosser. Anyway. You can't deny that this mysterious gentleman did know the watchword. Yes, Professor. If you didn't know that word, Mr. Windbank would never allow you to redeem the article. Or, looking at it another way. If you didn't know what word, Mr. Windebank would allow you to redeem the article, whether it was yours or not. So the question is, could this gentleman have found the watch out somehow? Uh, duh, the ledger. The ledger? No? Notelet? What is this? Look at this, Mr. Sato. Ah, it appears to be a memo that Mr. Windebank has scribbled to himself. Let's see, what does it say? Oh, Professor. He just wrote it there and left it? Mr. Winbeck must make a note of the watch words his customers give him right before their eyes. And an alarmingly clear script as well. Oh dear, I, I don't know where to look. Who knows what other secrets I might see? Okay, so I guess we're just giving that done. The method is revealed by the notelet on the counter to which your eyes were inadvertently drawn. Yes, the broker here follows the same procedure whenever a customer comes to redeem an article. He has the customer for the watchword and, watch and notes down the response uttered on the notelet he has to hand. Then he consults his ledger and confirms whether or not the watchword matches the one that of the article in question. I would expect nothing less of a diligent pawnbroker. Press 1 if you think Jelly deserves a cat for being awesome. Aw, thank you! But I prefer puppies. <laughs> I complained to my friend that I'm not matching someone on Facebook dating and I got an ad for eHarmony. Dude, I've been getting- I've been talking to, like, writing friends, um... Pregnant friends, and, um, talking about arthritis. So all of my ads are Grammarly, pregnant stuff, or like, yeah, pregnancy stuff, and um, arthritis uh, medications. <laughs> Fun times! When my friends were getting uh, engaged and pre preparing for their wedding, the only ads I got were engagement rings and wedding dresses and wedding venues. And I was like, guys, I'm not getting married. Calm down. Oh, and gee, you're pregnant. It's, it's, what's it called? Like a mirac oh, miraculous insemination? I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> You're getting married to a ghost. <laughs> but yeah, getting all those ads were annoying because it's just like, guys, I'm single. Stop showing me these ads. But now lately I'm getting a ton of um, horror movie ads because one of my friends loves horror movies. And because, like, she relates to me a lot, like, we've talked a lot, interacted a lot, so they're just like, Oh, you would like horror movies too! And I'm like, no, I don't! Stop showing me this! <sighs> but its diligence clearly has its disadvantages. What are you talking about? It's increasingly apparent that you were present in the shop before your accusation against Miss Lestrade. In all likelihood, you followed her inside and then observed her talking to Mr. Windbank. When a diligent broker made a note of the watchword, as is common practice, you observed him writing the word professor on the note notelet besides the ledger. And that, sir, was the master plan you devised to steal the pawn's article from the young Miss Lestrade. M master plan! Which brings us at last to the final chapter of this lyric scheme. Why would you go to such lengths to redeem that particular article from this pawnbroker? Are you quite serious? 
For an ill-fitting overcoat hardly seems to justify the effort, much less a worthless music box disc. But naturally, you had very good reason to make them yours, didn't you, Mr. Benedict? I have no idea what you're talking about. Allow me to present a rather interesting piece of evidence. You see, this picture postcard tells us all we need to know. The article we're talking about are the overcoat and the music box disc that's what, that was in one of the pockets. Which, according to Mr. Windbank, isn't even worth a penny. And yet this man went to such lengths to steal them. Why? I wonder if perhaps... We already have the evidence we need to explain it, Mr. Nanahodo. Could we? Really? I'd better have a thorough look at through all the evidence we've collected so far. <laughs> yes, all the one evidence we've collected. <laughs> you see, this music box disc tells us all we need to know. What's that? On the back? It reads, for Mr. For McGilded. Ugh! Oh. Ah, oh, Mr. Magnus McGilded. The unfortunate philanthropist who perished in curious circumstances at the Old Bailey two months ago. A prominent man in London, though his loan mongering demonstrated a distinct lack of scruples. So, you're an associate of his, are you? Or perhaps a subordinate? Mr. McGilded was a man of unusually small stature. In fact, he was precisely the right size for that overcoat that you squeezed yourself into. Ugh. Your true identity remains shrouded in mystery, Mr. Eggert Benedict. But the final conclusion here is crystal clear. The reason you came to this prom burglary today... ...was to retrieve an article left behind by the late Magnus Begilded. When was our trial with McGilded? To acquire an item deposited by McGilded. I think it was definitely after, it was in the 20s of February. So it had that's enough time for Gina to have met McGilded and interact with him for a bit. Well, well, Mr. Magnus McGilded. Not a name I expected to hear in these circumstances. Mr. Sholmes, I'm afraid there's something very troubling on my mind. Pray tell, Miss Susato. Well, according to what Mr. Windbank told us earlier, today was the final day on which the coat could have been redeemed, was it not? Yes, ma'am. That is correct. Today would be precisely two months since the vote was first deposited. Well, today is 15th April, so two months ago today... Would have been the 15th February, sir. That's right. It's all carefully recorded in my ledger. Deposited at 10.30pm, I see. What? But that suggests... Yes, 15th February. It's precisely the day on which the omnibus murder took place. So that's when the murder took place, and then the trial took place a day or two later. And half past ten in the evening is precisely the time at which the terrible events were unfolding. Yeah, because they got on the late uh, carriage. Suggested is not the word. It would seem the matter is entirely beyond coincidence. You are, of course, at liberty to make whatever outlandish deductions you choose. However... <gasps> I must insist you hand over the music box this now. It would be a terrible shame for you to return to your native land in a box. <sighs> what do I do? I'm going to save... <laughs> uh... And I'm not gonna hand it over. Someone else shoot him, please! 
There's some things a man must protect at all costs. This may, this may well be one of those things. Then again, it may not. Ooh. Mr. Wonderbank! This is my shop. I can't allow any harm to come to my customers. That was to happen. I should I should have to take my own life. Mr. Wonderbank, no! Alright, that's enough. Alright, that's enough! Oh! Inspector Gregson! Inspector? That's right, Sunshine! Your mom was raised on one of our dedicated emergency lines. So we got here as fast as we could. Now, what's all this about, eh? Oh, praise be. You're here at last! I was moments away from forfeiting my own life in my very own establishment. Oh man, Gregson and his voices are too similar. I don't know what to do! You gotta commit to that high-pitched voice. <laughs> Should I change Gregson's voice to that? It would seem you have the upper hand. Right, you and Lord have got some explaining to do. I don't appreciate being bothered with some petty argy -vargy. Petty? Mr. Winterbeck very nearly met with his ends. Here's a hint, the guy pointing the gun. <laughs> yeah, by his own god, as far as I could tell. Oh dear. And the whole Britain could meet with the sand if I don't get to the bottom of this case I'm supposed to be working on. What? What on earth is the case, Inspector? Spare no detail, Gregson. Alright, I might have said a little to watch. No matter, it's nothing to do with you, Lot. Anyway, sir, you're gonna have to come with me down to the station. But of course, Inspector. <gasps> He's getting away! Get out of the garage! Where's the beat officer too? Sir! Who is he? There's been a spell of deaths at pawn shops around here recently. So we fit in emergency buttons underneath the counters for burgers to let us know when there's trouble. Oh, Inspector, I was very worried there for a while. Very worried indeed. Now then, Mr. Permanently in Morning. Oh, yes? I'll be taking that whatever it is goes down to your own, thank you very much. Try it over. Oh, yes, of course. No, don't! Don't give it to him! It's mine, that is! Mine! I'm sorry, miss. Well, it didn't belong to Miss Gilded, has to be taken in as evidence now. As evidence? If the police demand something as evidence, my dear fellow, we have no choice but to capitulate. No, Jackie Chan or Wilson Hope! <laughs> it's all yours, Inspector. <sighs> And so we handed Mr. McGilded's disc over to the Inspector Gregson, over to Inspector Gregson, and were summarily turfed out of the shop and onto the street. To be continued. Ow, my heels hurt. Why? Ow. They feel tender. Ow. Uh, let's see. It's only been an hour, so let's go a little bit more. Fifteenth April Baker Street. See, that's why I hate grown ups. All they do is feed you a pack of lies and take stuff away from you. Oh, really, Miss Lestrade? Tell me, is that overcoat keeping you warm? What? Oh, my. Surely you were given that. Yeah, the day that we keep it, after I looked daggers at him for long enough. He went to the pockets and then said, Go on then, have it, before telling me to scalp her. Always pays off giving people a look like you ate him. I can't help feeling that it's going to get you into serious trouble one day. 
What I really want was that nice shiny disc, mind. Then why did you try to pawn it off again, you weirdo? The music box disc? But Mr. Winterback said it was practically worthless. I think I'm gonna go and have another bash. Give him a lull and all stare. I think not, Mr. Lestrade. We shan't enter Windbanks again today. Why not? That's not fair! It can't be helped, I'm afraid. The police are investigating the scene now and taking a statement from Mr. Windbank. But that this is mine! I have the ticket for this coat and it was in the coat's pocket! And there should be something else and all. That's what the, uh, that's what that rotten cove said, ain't it? Yes, he did mention something about another article, didn't he? Well then, that's mine too! Whatever it is! Now she's really pushing her luck. Mr. Strahd, I think it's time to admit defeat. You've had your hole for the day. Yeah? And it's all your fault, Shilms! Why is it his fault? So what are your plans now? Will you die with us this evening? Eh? Ours would be delighted to cook, I'm sure. And I might entertain you with a modest violin recital. No, ta. Oh. Why would I come with you around your place, eh? Have you lost your dad or something? I don't like you. Oh dear, she's gone. Hmm, having reviled on me quite unnecessarily, I might add. I can't help wondering. If perhaps she might turn up anyway. Interesting. Once she's had a chance to calm down, I think there's a good chance she'll decide to come. Of course, it's free food. Pretty well then. I'll inform Iris to set a place for our potential guest at the dinner table this evening. And one more thing. I should be glad of your company later, too. Sorry? I believe I will have a rather splendid surprise to show you. Oh, how exciting! What is it? You shall have to wait and see, Mr. Sato. Until later, then. Okay, so I guess we're moving. Hmm, let's go back to my office. What to do? Can it really be that we've been in Great Britain for two months already? Yes, it's gone by in a flash, hasn't it? And what an English gentleman you've... You trailed off there, sister son. I'm so sorry. When I thought it through, I realized it's not at all true, actually. I simply don't feel that any Britishness has really rubbed off on you. Nor are you, to be honest. Well... Well, that's obviously because... Yes, I know. Without a doubt, it's your kimono. It most certainly stands out. I do adore the attire of English ladies. It's quite delightful. But somehow, I just don't feel ready to abandon my Japanese dress just yet. I wonder how Susasu-san would look in Western clothes. That would be interesting to see. That was very helpful. Okay, I guess I still have stuff to do at Baker Street. Probably have to examine something. Um, or not? Then the only other option is to whoops, is to move to Sholmes' suite. I'm feeling really sleepy. Wow. I just got a hit with a wave of sleepiness. Ah, Susie and Rina, come in, come in! Good afternoon, Iris. Thank you so much for breakfast this morning. Oh, don't mention it. Goodness, look at the time already. Busy as always? I'm preparing everything for dinner this evening. Already? You're obviously cooking something special, are you? 
I just look at the chat. OMG, you're pregnant. What? <laughs> oh no, I was talking about all the ads I'm getting these days. Like I'm getting like baby pregnant ads, um, Grammarly ads, and what was the last one I said I was getting? Arthritis ads. I'm not pregnant at all. Oh yes, after all, we have a special guest joining us. Guess who it is? Come on, <laughs> you'll never guess. Um, look at those little eyes of her shining. Oh dear, it is awkward when you already know the answer, isn't it? It's Ginny! Isn't that exciting? Oh, oh, what a surprise! Yes, that's wonderful news! Wow, Iris seems overjoyed at the idea. I can't wait to learn some pickpocketing tips from a real professional! I read that weird. Oh yes, that does sound like fun. I'm not sure that's entirely appropriate. Are you, Mr. Nadahoro? Oh, are you, Mr. Nadahoro? Uh, by the way, Iris, what's Mr. Shulman's up to? Hurley? Oh, he's been like that ever since he got back. Hello, Mr. Shulman's. I beg that you won't speak to me. Sorry? I don't know who you are, but kindly take your leave. As you can see, I'm not here. But you are. I don't know how to respond to that. I do apologize. When he gets like this, he's completely oblivious to everything. Yes, I see. Really, he behaves just like a child sometimes, Hurley does. Mr. Sholmes and Iris have a something of a parent and child relationship, don't they? Yes, except that Iris is clearly the parent here. Come to think of it. I wonder where her real parents are. <gasps> We're gonna find out it's John! The, the teacher that died in the beginning. What's the matter, Rudo? You have ever such a funny look on your face. Oh, no, it's nothing. I know what it is. Why does this girl live here with Mrs. Sholmes, you're wondering? Am I right? How? How did you...? <laughs> oh, Bruno, I can read you like a book. I get ads for my email for a hotline, and if you're looking for good time stuff, I don't miss a size like that, so why am I getting this stuff? It might be because someone that you interact with a lot, like either a family member or a friend or a co-worker that you're in close proximity with, visits those sites a lot. Um... And so it like transfers to you too. You don't always have to like talk about the like certain topics to get ads for them, but if people keep clicking on certain stuff, like if I kept looking up computer things and then I keep hanging around my friends, then they might also start getting computer related ads too. <laughs> Ugh, this girl is dangerous. Don't worry, you can ask me anything. I won't mind. Uh, converse. Ginny. So, by Ginny, you mean Miss Lestrade, the young woman from the McGilda case two months ago, right? Yes, who also stole my experimental smoke grenade launcher. Although after that trial, I invited her back here and we had dinner together. And now we're best friends. Oh, <laughs> what a lovely tale. Now if I bump into her on the street, she runs away as fast as she can. Oh. Where are your parents? Why are you living with an old man? Answer us, little girl. For real. And I chase after her down the back alleys. Interesting idea of friendship. And then I let her have the latest color of smoke grenade I've developed. Oh. There's so many beautiful colors in the world. Ginny wants me to make a whole rainbow. I suppose this means... You've let Miss Lestrade keep the smoke grenade launcher, have you? Yes, that's right. I got bored of it anyway. Hurley always reacts the same way when I shot him, when I shoot him with it now. Poor Hurley. My mom was suspicious, had to explain that took a while. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not always your fault. It's because of other people around you. 
Oh, I can't wait for Ginny to arrive. It's been too long since she last came over. I'm so excited. I just hope she does actually come. Living with shows. I'm sure you've been wondering why it is that I live here with Hurley, haven't you? Well, it has crossed my mind. That and where are your real parents? My mummy and daddy aren't with me anymore. Mummy passed away when I was born. And at around the same time, my father... Well, he had to go to a faraway land because of one of the cases he and Hurley were working on. Oh. Wait a minute. Did you say he and Hurley? Yes. Daddy and Hurley were always solving mysteries, mysterious cases together. She didn't mention that before. He wrote them all in his diaries. That's in the metal chest over there. Really? He recorded them all? So, you mean it's true, Mr. Sholmes? Really did have a partner with whom he tackled some of his most taxing cases. Oh yes. I mean, it's always nice to have one, isn't it? So, Mr. Sholmes' partner was your father? Exactly. Hurley told me I wasn't allowed to look into the chest. But that only made me want to look even more, so I opened it up. And found your father's memoirs. Yes, so I asked Hurley. Who wrote these? He nearly fell off his chair. But then he told me, that's when I found out that the author of all those accounts was my father. So Iris's father was Mr. Sholmes' partner. Iris's father! I've practically lived with Hurley all my life. I was tiny when he took me in. So it came as quite a shock. When Hurley told me he wasn't really my daddy, I mean. It must have done. I wonder why Mr. Sholmes chose to tell you, and at such a young age. Hurley says it's because he wouldn't have been able to hide it from me. Oh? Well, having lived with Hurley all these years, you might say his ways have rubbed off on me. There's some things I can just see. Especially lies. I always know when people are lying before they open their mouths sometimes. Right. Anyway, I was so fascinated when I read Daddy's diaries. That's what inspired me to write the adventures of Herlock Sholmes, actually. I'd always assume Mr. Sholmes simply told you all those thrilling stories. Oh no, Hurley's hope is like that. He forgets everything. As soon as he solved the case, it all, van it all but vanishes from his head. Oh, I see. The other day it was so embarrassing. As usual, he totally forgot about the case he just solved. So the very next day he gathered together all the people involved and proceeded to solve the case again. It was quite a shock for everyone. You can say that again. You share your father's surname, don't you, Iris? That's right, Wilson. Daddy is Dr. John H. Wilson. And then from his diaries, he's a doctor of medicine, you see. Ooh, he really is a dad! Also probably to me to study and study so that I could earn a doctor as well. Iris' father went to some distant land and is a doctor by the name of John H. Wilson. The court will now hear the trial of Eunice Gennaro. Kindly state before the court the name of the victim in this case. The victim's name was Dr. John H. Wilson. That's right. Visiting professor of medicine at an Imperial Yume University. And the man who, in the most bizarre circumstances, lost his life just before we left Japan. Miss Susato. Yes? Perhaps we shouldn't pursue this conversation any further at this time. I think that would be for the best. Ah, oh, 
my dear fellows, how good to see you! Eh! Mr. Sholmes! Why ever did you not make your presence known to me before? Uh, well, no matter now. So, how the devil are you? We just saw each other, dude. We've been with you for most of the day. Goodness, really? Do tell me, Mr. Sholmes, is your violin unscathed? Hmm? My violin? Whatever are you talking about, dear madam? Oh, um... Never mind that now. I have something far more interesting to show you. Behold, my dear fellows! Oh, another music box disc. No, not another disc, Miss Susato. This is the one Gregson demanded we hand over as evidence. Mr. McGillan's disc. Oh my! Then, then, what's doing here? <laughs> you know, at times, Mr. Nadovodo, I think that though I have an undeniable turn for detection, I may very well, I may well be even more adept at larceny. He stole it. Oh, that would be wonderfully exciting. I'd be a pitbull in insistence. And Bruno could be our go-to lawyer if we ever get caught. Right. Plus, Susie has such beautiful handwriting, she can write all our menacing crime notifications. Yes, I'd be delighted. I'm just going to pretend this conversation has never happened, I think. Mm -mm -mm. Converse. There's so much conversing now. I don't understand. How did that disc come to be in your possession? I thought Inspector Gregson took it back to Scotland Yard. Quite correct. And that sort of uncompromising attitude is precisely why I always carry some of this. That's a bar of caramel, Mr. Sholmes. You're one and only friend in times of loneliness, if I'm not mistaken. If you will humor me, my dear fellows. Cast your minds back to when the good detective confiscated, confiscated the disc. No, no, I could talk. I'll be taking that whatever it is from Miss Skelter's down to the yellow Thank you very much. So hand it over. Oh, yes, of course. Whoa. Maka, thank you for so much for the 18 months sub. Woo! Hope you're well, dude. Happy Tuesday. If the police demand something else of this, my dear fellow, we have no choice but to capitulate. It's all yours, Inspector. For the briefest of moments, I had the disc in my hands, did I not? Yes. Yes, you did. But I still don't understand. It was at precisely that moment that I summoned my one and only friend into action. I pressed the disc into a pair of bars, like this. That is a gigantic caramel bar, what the heck? That's amazing! The disc and all the minuscule protrusions have made an image into the caramel. Indeed, this caramel is quite exceptional. I developed it myself, you know. Huh? Suitably soft for making impressions, but resistant to melting. The result of a precisely controlled solution. Oh, okay. How extraordinary! Carrying a pair of these on one's person frequently proves very useful indeed. Take a house key, for example. A simple press and its unique form is duplicated. I can enter anyone's property at will, and never without high sucrose nourishment. Yes, it sounds illegal. From the image, I was able to create this. I confess I was more curious to know what manner of music would issue from the disc when played. Our music on the disc. Do tell us then, Mr. Sholmes. What music does it display? Well, unfortunately, I have no idea. No idea? None whatsoever. Are you familiar with the workings of a music box, my dear fellows? No, I'm afraid not. Goodness, you don't know, do you know? Inside 
inside the music box, there's a special metal piece called a cone. That's what produces the sounds. Small protuberances pluck the different teeth of the cone as they rotate past it, making the different notes. The first music boxes to be invented used a rotating cylinder with protuberances on it. But over time, a new type of player was produced, which uses discs such as these. With that development, the popularity of music boxes spread far and wide, all around the globe. Why, exactly? Because the discs are easy to produce and can be interchanged to facilitate the playing of different tunes. There are a great many firms in Europe now manufacturing music boxes as a result. It is wonderful to be able to enjoy music, even when no performer is present. But it's the very success of the invention that means we are now presented with an insurmountable problem. What do you mean? As you may imagine, the construction of one's firm's, one firm's music box does not match that of another. And we have no way of knowing in which music box this particular disc was designed to be played. There is no resolution to this problem, I'm afraid. It's quite intractable. Ah, I see. So that's why... Naturally, I tested the disc in those few music boxes I have at my disposal. But as you can hear, to no avail. This sounds creepy. The results were equally unsatisfactory in this one. So... I am presently engaged in acquiring an example of all the music boxes ever made in Europe. Uh, every single one? That's holy for you. Always taking things too far. But my dear girl, an unsolved riddle is quite repugnant to my constitution. But surely all the different types of Europe will amount to a huge volume of music boxes, won't it? Hmm, yes, that is certainly true. In the worst case... I shall just have to ask you to vacate the attic room. What? Uh, Magnus McGilded. Magnus McGilded. Not a name I expected to hear again so soon. Yes, it's only been two months since that grizzly case. I'm getting so sleepy. Uh, my eyes are getting so heavy. Mr. McGill had perished within hours of the trial's conclusion. Was it the curse of the Reaper? No one knows, still now. Still now? The omnibus was reduced to a pile of ash. Not a shred of evidence remained. And with the man's death, the truth about the murder in which he was so intimately involved was buried. Even though we successfully established Mr. McGilded's innocence in the trial, the newspapers are still claiming that it remains an unsolved case. The murder of the brickmaker, Mr. Thrice Fired Mason. In the end, the truth of the matter remains a mystery. We still have no idea what really happened that night. And although Mr. McGilda was found not guilty through my defense, I still don't know if that was what uh, the right judgment or not. It would appear the case is not yet closed. Well, it's time to start getting things ready for dinner, I think. Ginny will be here before long. Thank you, Iris. Oh, well you must let me help you then. Of course, Susie. There's plenty to do. I think I shall investigate the condition of my faithful performing partner. Now then, where did I leave it? Let this be a lesson to you, Mr. Sholmes. Never leave anything too precious with the pawnbroker. Hmm, yes. You may be right. Oh, that reminds me of something Mr. Wunderbeck said before. 
He said that he had manuscript of Dyrus's in pawn, didn't he? Did he? Yes, he definitely mentioned it. Mr. Sholem's latest tale of otherworldly mystery lies dormant in my storeroom, were his words, I believe. So you heard about that, did you? I expect you were as incensed as I was. Oh, yes. The idea of such a wonderful story languishing in Mr. Windbank's storeroom gathered dust. My dear madam, I'm quite sure I told you already. The pawnbroker's storeroom is the safest place for it, more secure than a bank's vault. And what about your Stradivarius, Hurley? Was that safe and secure? Well, there may be the occasional mix-up. <laughs> Caused by a certain impetuous someone not too far from me now. <laughs> Do you have any idea how long it took me to write that Baskerville story, Hurley? It sounds so exciting! The Hound of the Baskervilles! I should love to read it! Huh? How do you know the title? Ah! What's going on here? Why does it feel like an icy chill just swept through the room? Susie, what did you just say? Um... You said the Hound of the Baskervilles. But how could you know the full title? Well, that's... That's because Miss Susato is such a great fan of all the stories about Mr. Shawls, of course. But Bruno, the Hound of the Baskervilles has never been published. What? When I showed Hurley the manuscript, he told me that I wasn't allowed to publish it yet. I don't understand. That's why he said he'd keep it safe. Until it's the right time for the story to be made public, you see. So that's why the manuscript is at Winderbanks. And yet, how could Susie here know its title? Well, Hurley, what's going on? Ah. Oh. What is it, Mr. Sholmes? It appear our guest has arrived. Mr. Strahd? This was a bad idea. I knew I weren't welcome. I'm going. No, wait, Mrs. Strahd. We've all been eagerly waiting your arrival. Haven't we, Iris? Oh, yes, just right there, Jimmy. We'll have everything ready in a jiffy. Come along, Susie. Right, of course. It's a pleasure to see you here, Miss Lestrade. Please, make yourself at home. Don't stand in the doorway, my dear girl. Come along in. What say you to Sir Mendelssohn? I won't take no for an answer. Meddlesome it is, then. Evening. Iris prepared us all a meal that was even more delicious than usual. Mr. Sholmes' violin performance was in no way meddlesome. <laughs> and Gina, as we came to call her, taught us all how to steal things from one another without being noticed. Oh my gosh, awesome. Everyone thoroughly enjoyed themselves well into the night. And then murder happened. Oh man, um, 
So there's more talking to be done, and I know there's more game to do, but I'm feeling really sleepy. So I think I'm going to... <laughs> It's been an hour and a half. Normally I would do another 30 minutes, but my eyes are just so heavy. So I'm just going to leave this episode here um, and I'll pick this up on Thursday night. And tomorrow night I might be streaming me playing the Final Fantasy 15 event in Final Fantasy 14. It's gonna be super chill though. Like I'm just gonna be like doing whatever. Not very good at Final Fantasy XIV, but yeah, uh, who knows? But yeah, it'll be super chill if I do end up doing it. So anyways, that's it for me tonight. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Stay toasty. Have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye.